want to see. Wave at someone, say hello. Welcome to those of you who are watching online, whether live or later on. Sometimes people, I think, watch our services, you know, a little bit later, and, and that's a real part of them getting church. And as Pastor Derek said a little bit earlier, if you were here earlier, uh, today will be different, a little bit different than a typical Sunday service. It's the first time we've ever done this, <laughs> which, uh, you know, there's some denominations, I guess, Christian denominations that have a World Mission Sunday every, every year or so or something like that. Well, today's going to be about World Missions. And uh, partway through, I'll tell you sort of the impetus in my heart as to why I asked Pastor Derek uh, about this. Um, world Missions may or may not be something that you think about, but it's something that God thinks about a lot. If I was to ask you, what is the most common or the most well-known verse in the Bible? What would you tell me? Can someone say it? Even the first part of it. God so loved who? The world. I know we sometimes retranslate a lot to think that he loves me. He loves you, and he does love me, and he loves you, but he loves the world. He loves the world. Uh, and, you know, the Bible says this. It's very clearly talking about people because he said whoever believes in him. So I think he might love the mountains and the waterfalls and the world, the physical world, but he loves the people of the world. And when he says the world, it's the world. It's the globe. It's everywhere. And, 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 you know, he loves more than just the Christians who show up at church and the people who love him back. He loves those who follow other religions and worship other gods and worship idols and hate his guts. You know, he loves people who didn't like him. He loves Vladimir Putin, who started a war in Ukraine. He loves Kim, Kim Jong-un, you know, who wants to, you know, do nuclear weapons from North Korea. You know, he loves drug dealers and terrorists. And, and, and he loves all sorts of people who don't love him. He doesn't love what they do. He loves them. And he loves them, and he loves people here in Canada, and he loves people in other nations around the world. And once again, let me reemphasize, he loves you more than you would ever know. And yet, you know, the world's a big place. And the heart of God is that he would give his son, his own son, to give life to people all over the world so that they wouldn't perish. I think, and I'll say it probably later on, I think it would do everyone well to, to step into a place where people are perishing. And where the gospel needs to go. And when the gospel goes that, to those places, you know, then you see the, necessi the necessity. You see the reality, the, 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 the reason why, you know, God calls us to world missions. And so the way people get this life that Jesus came to bring is simply by believing. Well-known verse that I share a lot when I'm doing, uh, you know, evangelistic invitations is Romans 10, 9. Where it just simply says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you would be saved. And so John 3, 16, Romans 10, 9, these are verses evangelists share a lot. And the reason why is just to point out how much God loves us and that he came to give us a message. Uh, he came to give us a message, and the message not just for us, but it's for people all over the world. You know, a few verses after this, verse, verse 9, verse 13 says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whoever. So it doesn't matter if they're in a Buddhist country or if they're, uh, you know, in an atheist country or some, somewhere else. Well, just a few verses after this in Romans 10, there is a series of four, I believe, super important questions. Super, super important questions. Three of them in Romans 10, 14, one in Romans 10, 15. And so these questions basically involve the eternal destinies of people. That's why they're important questions. The first of the four questions is this. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? It's a big question. Man, if you've ever been in a place where the, the religion of the place is 95%, something not Christian. You know, my wife and I were in Zanzibar. It's an island off the coast of Tanzania. Uh, a very, very Muslim place. You just feel overwhelmed by it. You know, and yet, how do those people call on him whom they have not believed? People need to call on God to be saved how are they going to do that if they don't believe in him? Pretty important question, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, and so there's lots of places in the world where there just aren't Christian churches in every neighborhood. And there just aren't, you know, people like you might find here. There are a lot of places where people don't believe in God, God at all and they don't know him. Well, the second question right there in the same verse says, how will they believe if they haven't heard? So the first question, you know, you know how will they call if they haven't believed? How will they believe if they haven't heard? Do you know there's simply tons of places around the world 
where people just haven't heard of Jesus. They don't know the message of good news. They don't know that he died to save them. They don't know that they can be forgiven of their sins. There are even people here in Canada, here in Saskatoon, that this verse applies to. It's a sad thing, but there are people growing up in a sort of a post, post-Christian culture that we live in who don't know much of anything about Jesus. You know, there may have been a time in days gone by when uh, most people in Canada would have known a little bit about Jesus. But there are people who grow up today in our day and age in a very secular uh, world who don't know hardly anything about Jesus. And so you can't call on him to believe if you haven't heard of him. And so then the third question sort of addresses how do people hear about him? It says this, how will they hear without a preacher? How will they hear without a preacher? God's way of getting his message out You know, his message about himself, his message about Jesus, his message about how we can be saved, how we can be rescued. His way of getting that message out is through preachers. Now, some might think preaching's weird. You know, preaching's outdated. You know, preaching's something that happened, you know, uh, in the 1950s. But preaching, no. You know, if you think that way, you know, the Bible even says this. And so I get it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Preaching actually creates a dividing line between the saved and the lost. If you think it's goofy, I'm sorry, but you're perishing. (laughs) And so if you think it's all right, you know, you're on your way to being saved. And and it really does create a dividing line. And if you've got a problem with preaching, uh, and there's lots of different ways to preach. Man, my wife preaches by cooking some good turkeys. You know, she preaches that way. There's tons of different ways to preach the gospel. Uh, But, uh, you know, if you've got a problem with it, take it up with God. Because the preaching of the gospel was his idea. The preaching, and using us, flawed humanity, you know, using us to be his vessel and the carriers of his voice and the carriers of his message, it seems like a bit of a, a strange way for God to go about doing things, and yet that is his choice. It was his idea. And you know what? It works. When we preach the good news of the gospel, the power of God is, is, is revealed. People say yes to Jesus. And then the last of the four questions here in the book of Romans, first three follow this progression. Can't call on him unless we believe in him. Can't believe on him unless we've heard of him. Can't hear of him unless there's a preacher. And then the last one, it says, how will they preach except they be sent? Here's the impetus for why I asked Pastor Derek if I could do this, have a, have a service like this about our missions organization that is birthed and operating from this church. Most of you have been in a service before. I'm looking around. I'm seeing maybe there's a few newcomers and a few guests here today. But if you've been in this church for any length of time, You may well have seen a service where myself or me and my wife or me and whoever or somebody who is going out on a missions journey and they're getting sent out and they come up and they get prayed for up at the front here. And I had this thought that, well, I felt uncomfortable about this because I kept getting prayed for all these times, all these times, all these times. And yet I had this thought in my head that there's some that just simply don't understand what's going on here. Why do we do that prayer at the front? It's totally based on this verse. How shall they preach except they be sent? I don't go anywhere by myself. You say, what do you mean by that? I go with you because I'm sent by you. I'm sent by this local church. If I was some sort of bone on my own and I just decided to just kind of go off by myself, that's dangerous. It's not scriptural. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's proper. I know some of you might have seen when you're coming up here. You know, one time I went to the Philippines when we still had Lifeway Training Institute. We used to have a life skills program. I was the director of it for a number of years. And I went to, I think it was to the Philippines or Indonesia, somewhere in Southeast Asia. And uh, when I got back, one of my students comes to me and she says, Hey, how was your vacation? (laughs) These guys are laughing because, you know, Lorna has been on some mission journeys. And they laughed. And they said, how was your vacation? Some of you are laughing because some of you might be thinking, why are we praying for Brad again? You know, where is he going again? Does he not like Canada? Does he not like cold weather? Well, actually, no, I don't. (laughs) And so, you know, does he, you know, why, you know, does he like just getting on airplanes? Like, why are we praying for him again? And so I thought it was important. It is important because it's part of the church and it's part of Christianity. World missions is something that has always been in the heart of God. And why I go is important that you know. And it's important because maybe it isn't just me that gets to go. Maybe you might need to go. And so it's important that we talk about world missions. That trip that that student asked about, hey, how was your vacation? I think I had preached something like 22 times. 
Pastor, Pastor Derek, Pastor Randall, <laughs> have you ever went through a few days where you preached 22 times in the life of City Center Church? No. And that's a normal thing for me. We're preaching sometimes three and four times in a day. We had Charles Kazumba here a month or so ago from, uh, from Zambia, uh, my good friend, and I've been to Africa with him. He kept me so busy. <laughs> like, when I went to Zambia with him, they basically stuck me on a motorbike and took me to a church starting at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, and then I would get there just in time to preach, and then as soon as I was finished preaching, I said amen. I said, man of God. They all call you man of God in Africa. Man of God, come. You must go. They stick me on a motorcycle, and I go to the second service. I preached three services. I was going to hold four fingers up and say three. Uh, three services. Three services before 12 noon. And so, because they just stick you in another serv service, and then you go, and you come in right after praise and worship, you walk straight up to the pulpit, you preach, 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 and then you go, and, you know, you're in another time zone. Your body is toast. You know, your body doesn't know where it is. It might be, feel like 3 o'clock in the morning to your body, but you go do it. And you do it, and that's part of world missions. And again, I'm, I'm not complaining or anything, but I want you to know about why we do those prayers when we come up. It's not just about a prayer that my luggage won't get lost even though that's an important part of those prayers, especially now. Uh, and so, because lots of luggage has been getting lost, and so uh, that's not going to happen to me. But I have had my luggage lost. One time I went to Romania, and all I put in my carry-on was a bunch of T-shirts. And I was preaching in a Bible school for five days, I think it was. And uh, day one comes, and my luggage ain't there. And I'm in the middle of rural Romania. It's a town so small. You know, we, you know, Carrie and Nathan were with us there. We actually went out. We said, what's there fun to do in this town? He said, well, we can watch the cows, cows come home. We thought they were joking. <laughs> and they weren't joking, because there is a time every day that those cows get let out to the field, and a time of the day, nobody tells them, that the cows all come walking down Main Street. And it's so crazy. They know I live at number 14, and I live at number 8, and the cows came home. And so we went. We looked like the stupidest tourists ever because, we, you know, here's all these town people, and every day the cows come home. It's normal to them. But we got our phones out, and just like, that's the craziest thing, man. The cows are coming home. And so my luggage had to find its way to that town where the cows came home. And, and, uh, and so all I had was T-shirts. And so I thought... Oh, okay, this will be okay. This is gypsies, you know. No, they're dressed in shirts and ties. I show up in my t-shirts. I had the same pair of pants for five days. Finally, my luggage showed up. And so you do pray for luggage to arrive. That's important. But this is so much more than that. And for those of you who prayed, I appreciate your prayers. But I want you to understand about missions. That God sends preachers all over the world to carry out his great commission. And I have that call on my life. And so the, the Great Commission, if you don't know what it is, it is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And God calls us. And some of us, we take that verse so seriously. It's just who we are. It's like that verse especially. It's like God took a knife and he carved it into your heart. And that's who you are. And there's some of you here that you're like that also. You carry that kind of a calling in your life. You know, that commission goes on to tell us that he, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who doesn't believe will be condemned. And it says signs and wonders will follow those that believe. And people will be healed and they'll be saved and they'll be delivered from demons and more. And God transforms lives through the preaching of his word. And there's so many places around the globe that need this message of life that have come to bring. So I have received something called Canadian Fire Missions. And our purpose, more specifically, is mobilizing evangelism and evangelists all over the world. And evangelists are simply leaders in the church whose task is to carry the good news everywhere and then to help the church carry the good news everywhere. And so we started this missions organization from this church about 10 or 12 years ago. And through this calling, God's brought me, brought several others uh, from this church into many, many nations of the world. Now, if you're interested in a bit of our history, uh, I had this box of newsletters. I make newsletters every three months. And so every three months, it's something different. It's something different that we've been doing. And so I, I just, when I don't use them all in a three-month period, I throw them in this box. And I just thought it would be kind of cool to set them all out. And so they're on the information table back on the left side here, uh, that if you want to go take some, look at some, whatever, go ahead. Uh, Scott called me a newsletter hoarder, uh, and I, I guess I sort of am that. I'll, I'll, I'll own it, because uh, I, I don't feel like, I don't like throwing mission stuff away, man. It's important to me. And so, uh, so I've got a history of probably about the last six or seven years of newsletters sitting on a table there at the back. And so if you'd like to see some of the places we've been and where we've gone, and so with that introduction, let me just play a short video. 
It's, uh, it's a little bit old, so it might look a little pixely, but this is just some missions quotes. If we could turn some lights down and play that first uh, missions promo, it's called. Every one of those quotes does it for me. I don't, I'm called to this. And so I, uh, I get touched by that. I've seen that so many times. But the calling's real. The souls are real. Uh, you know, the, the, the mission's uh, calling that God puts on people's hearts to go to nations with the gospel. You know, and it doesn't need to go to nations. The missions field begins right here. In, you know, it doesn't start on the other side of some ocean somewhere. It starts right here. You know, I preached in hundreds of churches around the world, and missions churches, a lot of missions churches have a sign at the back door. Have you ever been in a church like this? I think, uh, I think Rixie Armentero's church in Windsor has one of these. And it has, a, has a, a sign above the back door that as you're walking out of church, it says, welcome to the mission field. I love that. Maybe we should get one of those. Maybe I'll get one of those. And so somebody let me put it up. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll get one. And so, uh, and so, yeah, you're reminded that the missions field starts right here. And it starts right here. And so let me take you a few verses here in Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, I'm not going to preach long, but I'm going to share a little bit about different things here today. But Isaiah 6 verse 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Such a powerful verse. And then the verses that come uh, are super powerful. I'm going to read them in a minute. But I want to just park on this just for a minute. It's, it's, it's a part of the verse that you might just read over. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was a good king. He was a good king. If we go to 2 Chronicles 26, I got a couple of verses. I think I threw them in here. It just says, Uzziah did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all his father Amaziah had done. He sought God in the days of Zechariah. He had understanding in the visions of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. So the point of that is just to give you some history that Uzziah was a good king. He prospered as long as he sought the Lord. And yet his death, I think he was a king for a long time, and his death signaled an end of an era in the history of Israel. The good king has just died, and he was replaced by Ahaz, 
who the Bible says was wicked and evil in the sight of the Lord. And so it was a shift. It was like a transition, like what was talked about you know, a couple of weekends ago. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just wanted to share all this. You know, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. God gave a vision to somebody in the midst of this transitionary time, in this time when things were shifting maybe from a good season to a not-so-good season. And God, you know, knows what's going on in the world. And so right in the midst of the times and the seasons and the places where bad news is found, God will call and God will send somebody with good news. In the year that King, King, King of Elida, say that three times fast. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. And he's high and he's lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. I may have shared this before, but the train of a king's robe was like a lot of times uh, a king would have his crest, uh, you know, the, the, the crest or the important thing on, the, on, their, on their cape, on, their, on their, their train. And when one king would take over another king, they would sew that guy's train of his robe onto, you know, the, the king who defeated him. And when you think of this picture, that the train of his robe filled the temple. You get a picture of king of kings and lord of lords. That the greatest king of all time was who Isaiah saw in the year that King Uzziah died. And God will show himself alive and he'll send people to difficult places and he'll send people in the midst of difficult times. And so he deposited a vision in the heart of his servant about the majesty of God, about the greatness of the king of kings, about how he was high and lifted up in the midst of a dark time in the history of Israel. How God longs to duplicate this kind of thing over and over and over again throughout the nations of the world, throughout the times and seasons of the world. God wants to show himself alive in the midst of the darkest of times, in the midst of the darkest of places. God wants to reveal himself. And so he sends people to those places on purpose. He sends us to the broken with the good news that they can be restored. He sends us to the sick with his healing power. He sends us to the lost with the message that people can be saved. He sends us with the message that Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. It's not complex. It's super simple. He sends us to the most hopeless places on earth with a message that Jesus came to give life and hope and a future. So let's go a little further. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. He's high and he's lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim, one had six winds. These are angels. And it says, with two he covered his face and two he covered his feet and with two he flew. And one said, cried to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Uh, of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door shook were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. How would you feel if you came to church today and these poles that are holding up the ceiling just started shaking because God started speaking? And then church filled up with smoke. You, I bet you half of you guys would be running for your lives. Maybe me too, I don't know. So he says, verse 5, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It's just something about this encounter with God. Something about this time in the presence of God that caused Isaiah to become undone, and the word just literally means speechless. Something about this encounter that ignited something inside of Isaiah. He had seen the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God. And he recognized he needed help. Because God is awesome and he's holy and he's majestic. And yet he does not want to leave us in a speechless, unholy, helpless state. It's kind of what Isaiah was. He was undone at seeing the greatness and the holiness of God. And so the next couple of verses reveal the heart of God. Isaiah 6, verse 6 says, One of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. And he touched my mouth with it. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is purged. I love God. Right when we're in the midst of feeling unholy and and just helpless and speechless, and we can't, God, I could never, you know, God changes that. Because God has no desire that anybody be stuck in the middle of their sin and their iniquity and their hopelessness. 
He sent Jesus to the world, not so that the world would be condemned, but that the world could have life and forgiveness that every soul has been offered by Jesus. So then, what does an encounter with God like do for someone? When you see the greatness of God, I believe your heart should get captured by the greatness of his assignment here in this earth. So Isaiah saw the Lord, and seeing God left him in a place of willingness as soon as God made a request. God makes a request in the very next verse, Isaiah 6, verse 8. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Who's the us? The Trinity that we believe in, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. If you're a note taker and you like to put titles on messages, that's what this message is called, Here am I, send me. And when you get to know God, you'll want to go where he calls you to go. You'll have this, here am I, send me, written inside your heart. For me, at times, that means leaving behind the comforts of my Canadian home and going to people who don't have what we have. And sometimes the mission's journey is right here uh, in my own city, and this isn't just about me. This is about many of you, too. Many of you, you know, you're missionaries at heart because you're part of this church. And so sometimes the mission's journey is to a prison or it's to an, an addict on 20th Street, and other times it's to the ends of the earth where Jesus has called us to go. In any case, it's not always convenient or comfortable. You know, I I was in the Dominican Republic a few years ago. The Dominican Republic has a a resort city on the end of the island called Punta Cana. And Punta Cana has hotels that are $1,000 a night, probably more. Five-star hotels, six-star hotels, seven-star hotels. Just so you know, I don't stay in those places (laughs) when I go on missions journeys. I wish, I wish, I wish. On that island, you know, Punta Cana is a resort city, but it's, it's, it doesn't fit with the rest of the island. If you've ever been anywhere else on the island, like Santo Domingo, the capital. Santo Domingo, the capital, I went with, I went with Lorna's son into Santo Domingo, and we walked into a park where they got a huge monument for Christopher Columbus because he landed on that island. And we were looking at that, at that park. It was later in the afternoon. We walked into that park. And then we walked through, and the, our hosts were showing us some stuff before a church service in the evening. We came walking back, and the police would not let us walk through that park because it was getting a little bit dark. They said, you are gringos. You will be killed. <laughs> and so that's Santo Domingo for you. And I stayed in the pastor's home. Jared and I stayed in the pastor's home. He'd probably tell you about some of the adventures. If there are five-star hotels in Dominican Republic, this was 0.5 stars. And I don't say that in a derogatory way because it's just reality for people. He did not have running water, did not have a bathroom door, uh, didn't have beds. You know, I stayed in Nepal one time. I come into this room that they said was mine. And, uh, you ever see those, like, those, they're sort of like our blinds, those wicker blinds that you can have. They're about one millimeter thick. That was my mattress <laughs> on boards. And so I thought, okay, uh, I didn't sleep very good that night. <laughs> and so it wasn't five star. In fact, that night I didn't sleep good because... I had my hand up against the mosquito net, and mosquitoes love my Canadian blood, my whatever. And they bit me probably 30, 40 times, all down this left side of my hand and down my wrist. My fingers swelled up like sausages. I couldn't put my ring on, couldn't wear a watch. My hand was just swollen. And I just thought, wow, okay. Uh, Again, I'm not looking for a pity party. These are just experiences you have. And staying in that pastor's house is, I think, something every one of us needs to do at some point in our life is just to get our eyes opened up to the reality of the world outside our Canadian world. Because we just don't know. Now, I know there's some rough places in Canada. There are. There are some tough places in Canada. But do you know that even the smallest welfare check for a single person in Canada is probably triple or quadruple? I think the lowest welfare check for a single person is something like six or seven or $800 or something like that. At least it, what, that's what it was when I ran Lifeway several years ago. That seven or eight hundred dollars represents three months' wages, four months' wages, what people live on in many countries in the world. And so I think everybody needs to see that. Because you could watch a World Vision, you know, TV show. It doesn't register like going there and stepping on foreign soil and seeing and hearing and smelling the world that God loves. God so loves that. Those people that have nothing sometimes. You know, one time I was in India, and there's a lady 
I don't know how people do it. I'm not going to try to do it because I don't think I can do it. I'd hurt myself. But they sit on their feet. I don't know if you've ever seen people, Pastor Jim's been there, but they have this way of sitting. So she's sitting there with a metal bowl, and the pastor took me into a slum. I cried when I went to the slum with this pastor because this pastor oversaw 900 churches. 900 churches. He, he, he was on TV. He says, my TV program in India is a small program. We only reach about 60 million people. In India, where there's 1.5 billion people, 60 million is a little minority. He's an important guy. We drive through the countryside of his part of India, and as, uh, you know, his churches were called Natanya, which means he gives, God gives. And everywhere I'd go, we'd be in the middle of nowhere, and there's a sign, Natanya Church, two kilometers, Natanya Church. So this is this important guy, Bible schools, uh, homes for widows, homes for the blind. You know, he's just overseer of so many things. And we go into the slums. He knew every person in the slum by name. And I just thought, who did I just meet here? I just met Jesus of India. Thank you, Father. That's what God calls us to be. A living Jesus to a broken world. I meet this guy, and wow. You know, he just, he takes you somewhere, you know, that your heart can't go. I heard somebody say it this way one time. A missionary isn't just somebody who crosses the sea. A missionary is somebody who's seen the cross. And Isaiah had this vision of God, and it affected him. And I, too, have a missions calling, and it altered my life. Some of you know my story. Maybe you don't. I have a four-year degree in business. I studied here at the University of Saskatchewan. I had a job lined up after my university to work in an accounting firm, and yet God altered my life with a missions call. And my wife and I, we've been here since day one of City Center Church. You know, there's even a picture of us before we had City Center Church called City Center Outreach. There's a picture of a very much younger Brad and Kim and Jim and Kathy uh, on the wall over there that someone found of us from the very first service in 2001. And the reality is, is that this church is a mission. This church is a mission unto itself. It's no accident we are where we are. And there's some people who don't want us to be here. That's too, ba- that's too bad. That's their problem. Because God called us here, and this is a mission here. And so missions is a part of our DNA. You know, the very first uh, quote that was in that little video, I just says, a church without missions is a church without a mission. That's not here. This church has always believed in missions. And always believe in missions. And yet right here in the midst of this mission to the inner city of Saskatoon, God called me to world missions from this mission. That's not funny. (laughs) Sorry, Annette, you're laughing, but that was hard. But yet God had a plan. And I believe he took the context of what God is doing here and sent me to the nations with it. And I had been on a couple of missions journeys before we started this church. uh, and, And... And then yet went through a big season, to me, a long season, a painful season, where I didn't do anything. I didn't go anywhere out of the country for a few years. And we were busy planting this church. And it was important, and I was a big part of it. I'm not going to lie, though, it was a tough season for me. It's a super tough season for me. I'd sit in Pastor Jim's office, tears pouring down my face, because I felt called to the world. Yet how do you do that from an inner city church? You know, how do you do that? There's so many needs here. And those needs are foremost here. I get it. Yeah, how am I supposed to go from here to the missions of the world, to the nations of the world? How do you go into missions from a mission? And I didn't know the answer to that question. Pastor Jim didn't either. Did you? (laughs) No, we didn't know. And so I would say stuff and he'd think I was a crazy man. And yet I had it burning on the inside of my heart. And yet God knows how to make a way where there seems to be no way. And the story of Canadian fire missions is 150% that. Is that from an inner city mission, God sent us into the world. I remember coming to the point in my prayer times where it almost just became like a desperate cry inside my heart, and it, it, like a real divine discomfort. And, you know, Dwayne White talked about transition a couple of weeks ago in our Metavasi conference. And if you've ever been through a major life transition, it's not comfortable. It's not always easy to go through those shifts 
I remember Chris Ward when he was working here and yet had a call to pastor where he is up now in, in La Ronge. I remember being with him, uh, you know, one time we were in Calgary together and he and I drove back to get, from Calgary together. I picked him up off the floor. He was going through such a hard time. And then a little bit later, when I'm going through that same kind of shift, that transition, that season, uh, going through the difficult, he picked me up off the ground. And so I remember saying to Pastor Jim one time, this isn't just a matter of personal ambition or me wanting to go somewhere. It's not what this is. This is if I don't do this, I'm not obeying God. And the Apostle Paul said something like this as well. He said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Again, I don't try to compare myself to the Apostle Paul. But we had a man of God come and visit our church, and he spoke a prophetic word over me in the middle of that very difficult transition season for me. And he called me out of the crowd, didn't really know me from hardly anybody at that time, and called me out when we were still meeting in the upstairs across the street. And he called me out, and he pointed his finger at me, and he said, now is the time for you to be released into your mission's calling. When you get a stranger who barely knows you comes and says something and reads the mail of exactly what's going on inside your heart. And so God began to open some doors and he provided and one nation after another opened the doors and welcomed us and I've now preached the gospel in 36 nations around the world and I get invitations every week to go somewhere else. And God's provided and he's done something from right here in this church and I don't know how to emphasize that enough. I wish I could just spell it out that this church is where God called us, not just me, into world missions. Because Lauren has been, Pat's not here, but she's been, uh, Matthew's been me, with me, I think he said five trips. Dennis and Verona, totally are missionaries. I'm, and that's not even all of them. Those are just the ones who have went. Pastor Jim's been to India a few times from here. And, and so, you know, God's done this from here, on purpose from here. He knows what he's doing when he set things up that way. You know, there was a man of God named William Carey, one of the first missionaries in the modern missionary movement. He had the same kind of mission fire burning inside his heart. And he would go to the leaders of his denomination every year to see if some sort of mission society could be created. And year after year, William Carey approached these leaders, and they just couldn't see what this pioneer missionary had in his heart. He saw India being impacted with the gospel. He saw Bibles being translated into other languages. He saw orphanages being built. He saw things that they just didn't see. One year he came and he preached a message from Isaiah 54 where it says, enlarge the place of your tent. Great verses. And then he said something that you maybe heard before, but maybe you don't know where it comes from. But a part of that message he preached said, had those famous words that he says, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. One of the leaders said to him, young man, sit down. When God chooses to convert the heathen, he will do so without your aid or mine. And that was the sort of Calvinist thinking of that church at that time. And yet even after his passionate appeal from the scriptures, it appeared again that the church leaders were not impressed and nothing was going to happen. And so he said, he, he grabbed the hold of one of his friend's arms and he said, is nothing going to be done again, sir? And in no way am I comparing my story to his. So don't draw those parallels because that's not what I'm doing. William Carey cried out and his passion for missions prevailed. And the leaders went from seeing foreign missions as ridiculous uh, and seeing foreign missions as some sort of extravagant side expense that maybe you could do or couldn't do. I'm so thankful this church believes in missions. Lots of churches don't. They do nothing about it. Absolutely zip. Nothing. This church believes in missions. We believe that missions is not just important, but it's attainable, it's doable, and, it, and it's necessary. And so Carey started a work, William Carey started a work in India, great personal cost to himself personally, his family, his son died over there, his wife got really sick. Thousands of souls were impacted through his work as one of the first modern day missionaries. I don't know about you, but stories like that touch my heart. And maybe it's just because I share that mission's calling. Every one of those, those, those quotes on that, on that little video I played for you, they touch my heart. Why? Because this is my people. You know, that's how I feel when I hear people write stuff like that. Like, I don't want to, uh, you know, live my whole life. How did they, one guy say, close to a chapel bell? I want to start a rescue mission within, within a yard of hell. Welcome to City Center Church. Woo! <laughs> you know what? 
<laughs> Every day there's, you know, people sleeping under the awning and stuff here. I love it here. You know, Kim and I, we were coming back from Africa a few years ago, and we had the opportunity to stop in London. So we went, to, we went into Westminster Abbey. And Westminster Abbey is, I believe, the church where the Queen's body was just uh, laid there for viewing. And the thousands and thousands of people walked past her body in this famous church. I believe it's the center of the Church of England. Is it? The pastor knows these things. I don't know these things that well. We got a chance to go there. You've been there, eh? And so as you walk through uh, Westminster Abbey, were you guys there? Yeah. There's all the, there's, there's many, many kings, important officials buried underneath that church. And so you'll be walking through, you'll be walking through the church and it'll be saying like King Edward IV and you know, I don't know if these are real guys, you know, King Henry VI or whatever. And they're all through the church, the front, the back, whatever. But as we're walking through there, I got stopped in my tracks. Because one name stood out for me. I wasn't a king or a queen. But God's called you to be a missionary. Don't stoop to be a king. You know, that was one of the quotes there. It was David Livingstone. And he's there. Most of him. If you know his story, Pat will know his story because I think she's seen it. Because his heart's in Africa. And he went as a missionary from England and he went into Zambia and into that area of Africa. And before they sent his body back to Africa, they said, we can't send his body back to Africa. Tear his heart out and we'll bury his heart under a tree right here. Forgive me if I get a bit emotional. But the mission's calling overwhelms your heart. It's real to me. And Jesus was serious when he said, go into all the world. He meant it when he said it. In Isaiah's vision, you know, the angels surrounding God, they said something so powerful when they crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Not only did they sit around calling Jesus God holy, but they said, the whole earth is full of his glory. The mission of God is a mission to the whole earth. And Jesus said, go into the world. And so when you're serious about serving him, you're serious about the things he's serious about. You know, I go again this week. I'm going back to, back to Costa Rica. I've been part of a move of God there. I'll be preaching in schools starting Wednesday, all this week. I get there Wednesday, starting Thursday. And I'll be preaching in schools. I've been told that 95,000 kids have come to Christ as part of this move of God so far. They're shooting for 150,000. Some 300 schools opened up. Kim went with me to Panama a few years ago, and we saw literally every school we go into. I think there's a picture on the thing I'm going to show you at the end where they're standing, me standing there preaching in a school gymnasium, and every kid has their hand raised. And that happens regularly. Uh, and so I'm going to be a part of that, so please pray for me for that. Uh, and so I'm bringing a young man with me from Flying Dust Reserve. Uh, and if you have in your heart, if you share my calling, or if this is burning inside of you, I would love to see more people from this church joining us in world missions. And many here have already joined me, and you know what, I'm open to that, and I, I encourage it. Uh, let me just tell you that there are some things that qualify you to be able to go. Are you faithful to God? Are you faithful to the church? Can you be counted on? Can you follow instructions? Do you reach out here at home? You don't reach out of here on home. Why would God send you somewhere else to go do it? So they say, I want to go on missions. Okay, come Thursday night. We feed hot dogs to people. No, 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 I'm too busy for that. Well, then you're probably too busy for missions. You know, it's not just about getting on a plane and going somewhere far away. It's about what we do when we get there. If I was just going to go on a vacation, I would not choose the majority of the nations that I've been to. <laughs> you know, after Costa Rica, this same trip, this month, I'll be in Honduras. If you go on the Canadian government website about, you know, inquiring about traveling to Honduras, the Canadian government pretty much basically says, don't go there. <laughs> they say it's dangerous. It's unsafe to go into these places. Uh, and so, you know, I've been to almost 60 nations, and I have never seen anything like what I saw when I was in Honduras. You get somebody with an AK-47 machine gun uh, guarding the neighborhood as you drive into the neighborhood. You have to have your windows open as you drive in the neighborhood because if you have your windows closed, they think you're trying to hide something and they will shoot you without even asking questions. I, did a, I took the one picture out of me because you probably couldn't see it or understand it, but there's a pic, I had a picture yesterday. I put a bit, of, a bit of a slide thing together here for the end. And uh, there's a picture of me standing on the side of a zigzaggy mountain road. And that's how Tegucigalpa, the capital, it has 
mountains that go up the side. And so the, the, the roads go up the mountain like this, zigzag. So in one of the straightaways, they set up a stage. They had hip-hop dancers. They had lights. They had everything. And it overseen the city. And they called that outreach. They called that area of the city. Uh, oh, I can't remember it in Spanish. But it means in English, upper room. And a pretty cool place to be. And for me, it's unforgettable. And I said the totally stupid gringo thing. I said, wow, you've shut off the street, and this is the only way to get up into this neighborhood. Did you ask permission of the city to do this? Dumb Canadian question. And they started laughing at me, and they said, no, we asked permission of the gangs. I thought, oh, okay. The gangs control the president. They control everything in that country, and I'm going there. Yay. <laughs> I'm flying home from San Pedro Sula, known as the da most dangerous city in the world for gangs. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I'm excited about going. I heard someone say it this, this way one time. A missionary is someone who may leave his family for a short time so others can be with their families for eternity. You know, I've been away from home on Valentine's Day, my anniversary. I've counted hours until I could be back home on many trips. It's crazy. Because before a trip, I can't wait to go. And yet when I'm there, sometimes, you know, it's hard. I love my wife. I love my home. I love this church. I don't do what I do because I love airplanes and airports. You know, I was in Uganda one time again with Charles Kazumba. I saw nothing of the country except the road between the hotel where I was staying and the place where I was preaching. Kazumba didn't care because he's from Africa. I'm thinking, I'm in Africa. I want to see a monkey or something. You know, there was monkeys running all over, so I saw a monkey. But, uh, you know, I want to see some of the country. And he's like, no, we're on a mission from God. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, buddy. You know, It's Kazumba. He's great. Not complaining. But I'm just saying, it's not a vacation. It's a sacrifice. And we do it because of souls. And the purpose of Canadian Fire Missions is to carry the gospel to the nations of the earth, but specifically to help churches and evangelists with outreach efforts. That's my call. Everywhere we go, God connects us with evangelists. Some are frustrated and ready to give up. Others don't know very much about their calling because sometimes the evangelist doesn't fit inside traditional church structures. Many church structures do not recognize apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. They recognize pastor and teacher. That's it. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, who are they? What are they? <laughs> That's the Old Testament. And they don't recognize that there are these different callings that God has placed in the church. And like I said already, many churches around the world don't invest hardly anything into evangelism. And so God calls us to lift up the hands of the evangelists around the world. And he calls us to speak into the lives of leaders. I liken the evangelist that, you know, Jesus talks about the body of Christ. I liken the evangelist to the feet of the body of Christ. The Bible says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, I can't reach Uganda or Malaysia or Romania or Colombia because I don't speak the languages of those nations. And yet God's called leaders in those nations to make a difference in those nations. There are evangelists in those nations. There are outreach leaders in those nations. And yet sometimes they don't even know. You know, I just think of this. The time I was just telling you about, about where my luggage didn't make it with me. I was pre preaching in the Bible school. And there is a long, like, a long-time Christian. She'd been a Christian for a very long time. She was translating for me. She had been grown up in a Pentecostal church. And I used the word outreach. And when I used the word outreach, she looked at me and she said, what? And I said, an outreach. And she said, what? She didn't know that word. Her church so did not reach out that she did not know what an outreach was. And so I had to explain to her some sort of an evangelistic event where we reach out and we tell people about Jesus, we've done thousands from this church. See, I can't reach those places if I don't know the language. And, and so if we go and we make a difference in leaders' lives, those leaders can reach their nations. When you impact leaders, you impact nations. And there's several evangelists in several nations around the world. They've stepped into their calling because of the work we've done from Canadian Fire Missions. And this comes out of City Center Church. You need to know that. That there are some men and women of God that serve God in evangelism today because of stuff that we've done. I'm so thankful. One of my greatest pride and joy, you know, I, there's, a, there's a young evangelist in Romania that, that Dennis and Verona will know, hurting and broken the first time I went. 
and he latched a hold of me. And he, he dragged me into his home and asked questions nonstop for hours about the calling of an evangelist. And in his church, he was the only one. And so he'd go to the streets by himself and he'd preach Jesus because he had a fire burning inside his heart. Uh, Carrie knows who, who I'm talking about too, is Levy. And so God spoke to me one time here just praying in Canada, go with Levy and take him into another country. So go to Romania, preach in Romania, but take him elsewhere. So we did. And we went to Moldova together the first time. And so, you know, he preached and I preached and was able to sow into his life. But to me, the greatest moment was about a year later. I get a phone call one day. It's weird when you get a phone call from Romania. He says, Brad, I'm taking the team to Moldova. Man, I felt like proud papa. And then together, Chris Ward came with us. But we went into more nations because we went into Slovakia, Hungary, and uh, Ukraine together as well. And so my heart is into sowing into young evangelists. Next week, or next month, I should say, November, I'll be bringing a Honduran evangelist. Honduras is a very poor nation, but I'll be bringing him with me into, into Nicaragua. And so God, you know, we speak into their lives. Their lives are forever changed. You know, it blesses me so much. You know, sometimes when you come as a guest, the, the, the host church will do all sorts of things to accommodate their guests. Oh, this is an evangelist. He's coming. So let's set up some outreaches. And so they'll pursue things that they've never pursued before. They'll go fight to get an open door in the, in the biggest shopping mall of the city. And so we've done drama in the center of the shopping mall in the middle of a city or in a university. They'll go and they'll, they'll beg and they'll plead and they'll sign, fill out papers and they'll do whatever they need to do to get into a university. But you know what pleases me more than that? Is when that continues when we go home. And that's happened again and again and again. Is that we provided that bit of a push, that impetus towards outreach. And then the church sees outreach isn't just about that foreign evangelist that comes in and blows in, blows up, blows out. But that, that the calling to reach out is something that we as a church should always be doing. And so that's happened over and over again where that university outreach started because we came, but it continued after we left. And I'm so thrilled about the latter. You know, When we can speak into the lives of leaders, you know, I said it a minute ago, you impact leaders, you impact nations. I'm almost done here. God's been able to multiply the calling of the evangelist. And I know many evangelists do big crusades. And I would do them too if that's what God called me to do. But that isn't really how he's called me to do or what to do. It just, it just doesn't really burn on the inside of me. And I think the greatest thing we can do in our lives is just find the will of God and step into that. I used to struggle with this. It used to bother me because I'd see the newsletters of other evangelists and they'd say, we've reached 40,000 souls in that crusade. And I'm just like, 40,000, wow. <laughs> and God's called me to reach leaders. And when I'm reaching leaders, I won't see big numbers like that. I got to be okay with that. You know, Dwayne White doesn't know me that well. I've not spent a ton of time with him. But he walked over there and he prayed over me and he said, a couple of weekends ago, that some of my greatest meetings will be with six people. He doesn't know how important those words are to me. He has no idea. And he said, you'll take your time with a few evangelists. You'll pour your life into them. I'm 35 years into this. You know, I preached in a conference in Uganda one time. And here's the thing. I can't emphasize enough. Like, I wish I could just bring you all with me. I'm going to show you a few pictures, but I wish I could bring you with me. We did a conference here, Metavasi, two weeks ago. It was work. How many people attended? I don't want to pick on us. Or 150? Like, what, what was it? Again, not trying to toot my own horn or anything like that, but just I want you to see the scope of things. That many times we've been in conferences where there's 800 res registrants or 2,000 registrants or 400 registrants, and you're in this massive conference, and they're leaders. So all of a sudden, you're speaking to the leaders of a nation. And it's crazy that that's the kind of open door that opened for us, for me, from 20th Street West in Saskatoon. And again, I can't tell you, I, can't, I don't know how to emphasize that. I just don't. Now here's one picture. I'm preaching in this conference. There's about 400 leaders in this conference in Uganda, in Kampala, just outside of the city of Kampala. There's a church that started a university. So we're on the university campus. I got to share a session. The pastor, the lead pastor of that whole apostolic guy over that whole movement, he loved that session so much, he said, you must do a session for all of our evangelists. 
thought, you know, amen. You know, that's, that's when I feel like I just died and went to heaven. And so, uh, so he sets it up for the next day, but it wasn't a part of the conference schedule. And so there was this big, long, narrow room. And he says, this is the best we can do. We'll put you at the back of the room. But there's another guy doing a session about marriage at the front of the room. So there's a marriage session at the front, and these evangelists are going to show up at the back. So I stand there at the back of the room, and about 30 or 40 evangelists showed up. And I just knew as soon as I saw that situation, this is a fail waiting to happen. I'm sorry, <laughs> but this ain't going to work. It was a good-sized room. It was at least as long as this room, maybe a little bit longer. But uh, I was at one end there at the other end. And so I looked, and they had the windows open, and it was a beautiful day outside, middle of Africa. I said, evangelists, we're called to go out. <laughs> so let's go outside. And you're gonna sit, bring your chairs with you. We're going to do our session outside. And so we did. We do our session outside, and I got these evangelists, and they are feeling like they just died and went to heaven because someone invested into their call. I'll never forget Alma Moses. Some of you know who she is. But I preached a message at Circle Drive Alliance one time uh, as part of a Prairie Fire Unite. And Alma came up to me, bawling her eyes out. And she said, nobody has ever spoken to me about my calling. She said, you are the first. She gave me, she's a First Nations evangelist from Meadow Lake area. She gave me this, this uh, napkin, cloth, whatever, handkerchief, yeah, with a First Nations design on it. And she said, this is a sign that we're called together. Together we went to Nepal and ministered together a few years later with a couple of other guys. And so, but anyways... I took those evangelists outside. We did our session outside. Those guys were touched. Actually, the wedding people, the guys from the marriage seminar, they still complained at me. <laughs> it was funny because they came up to us afterwards and they said, keep it down. There's another session going on right here. And I thought, we were going to be in the same room. <laughs> and we went outside for you. But they said, you're still too loud. <laughs> that's us, man. That's evangelists. We're big mouths. I tell you that story to tell you this. One of those men was so grateful. He thanked me profusely. And then I came back to Canada, and he sent me pictures. He said to me while we were there, he said, pray for my crusade. It's coming up in a few days. I thought, okay, no problem. He sends me pictures of his crusade when I get back to Canada. He goes, last night was not a very big night. We only had about 7,000 people. But pray for the final nights that it will go up to 10,000. And I'm like, I never preached in front of 7,000 people, 10,000 people. What are you doing, God, putting guys like this into my life? And yet he's telling me, pray for him. I'm thinking, man, dude, pray for me. <laughs> and yet my call is, yeah, speaking to the lives of other evangelists. So let me tell you about a few practical things here about Canadian Fire, and we'll wrap it up here. I see what time it is, and I knew I'd go a little bit long. I usually don't. But uh, you get one chance at something in 10 years, so you, you go for it, eh? So we have, a, we have a local group of evangelists. We got those slides. I don't know if they find their way up there. We have a local group of evangelists and also an international group. There's an international group that has, I think it's right around 200 evangelists now. This was my COVID project. God had been putting this in my heart for years, and I wasn't doing it, and I wasn't doing it, and I wasn't doing it. And he gave me that acronym, LIFE, Local and International Fellowship of Evangelists, because I found that evangelists need each other. And I get strengthened when I hang around my own kind, my own people. And so we started this group. We have a local group. Uh, there's Matthew with his dirty pants there. He probably doesn't. He always shows up from work. I, I, I get it. But he's in that picture. But we have a local group. We've got about 20 to 25 people. Some come from as far away as, as Tisdale, Meadow Lake, Prince Albert. And they come and they meet with us. And we, we try to meet once a month. And, uh, but the international group has over 200 from 28 countries. And that's a pretty cool thing that's, that's come about uh, when God spoke to me about it, I just thought it was during COVID. And he just thought, if you don't do this during COVID, you're never going to do this. And so, so we did that. And you know what? Thursday, just to give you an example of something that we do, we, I started putting together resources. So this is a resource we put together for stuff that evangelists deal with. This one's called Working with Translators. And so it's a resource uh, that if you have to speak with a translator, it's a skill. It's a learned skill you can't just you know you can't just be good at it automatically and i've had translators in more than 30 languages and so i've preached in a lot of places and so learned a lot of lessons over the years if you ever have to speak with a translator and you want to copy this come find me i'll give you one and so we have other resources there's this healing booklet that you may have seen many times when people get prayed for the sick we give them one of these healing booklets this is all the verses in the bible about healing we've had that translated into other languages and so we've got some resources that we put into people's hands 
Um, if you'd like to know some more about Canadian Fire Missions, I mentioned the history of newsletters at the back. Those aren't current. There is a couple of current ones there, but I have an overview one. And so if you'd like to know more about us and pray for us, and you want to know just the broader scope, which I rarely get a chance to share about, then, um, yeah, if somebody could stand and maybe hand some of those out, put those in people's hands. And, uh, and you'd like to know, you know, this is an overview. This one is not. I give these out every three months about what we've most recently been doing. But the overview just tells, like, what I'm doing right now and just some of the different facets of what we do. And so just two other facets I'll give you. And, uh, yeah, put them in everybody's hands, huh? no, whether they like it or not. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, we do evangelism workshops. We call them E2E. Uh, so it stands for Equipped to Evangelize. And it's a time where churches take a day or a two or a couple of evenings or something like that and uh, just focus on evangelism. And so participants usually get some kind of a workbook. They can take notes in, learn a lot about sharing Christ. A lot of times with evangelism, outreach, it's not just about studying it from a book. you got to study it and then go do it. And so a lot of times they'll pair that with some working, uh, some, uh, some evangelism outreach. And then uh, Canadian Fire School of Missions, another sort of COVID project, but I've been working on this one for the last few years. And so I'm presently teaching the eighth course for this Missions Bible School. It will be online. It's very close to being able to be put online. Uh, if you're interested, let me know. Our email's in the newsletter. So we've got courses on healing, world missions, soul winning, you know, world religions, the course on miracles, that's invitations to supernatural, community outreach, preaching course, that's communication basis. So there's eight courses. So they're longer courses, 10, 12 weeks each. The other thing I want to mention here before we wrap things up here is that we're able to do what we do because people believe in us and they support us financially. Not ashamed to say that. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that because when people give into this ministry, Canadian Fire Missions, I'm not the beneficiary. The people we reach are the beneficiary. And I'm not, I didn't ask Derek if we could take up an offering, so I'm not planning that. If you want to do so, I'm not going to stop you, that's for sure. But, <laughs> but here's the thing I did want to say about finances. The way I'm able to do what I do is through faithful churches and people who give to us monthly. You know, when you go into a place and somebody gives you a one-off kind of offering, that's great, but you can't build on that. This is very difficult for a missions organization to do something just because you don't know what it's going to be. And yet if you know because people have committed to a certain amount every month and they give every month and they give every month, and I couldn't talk about this if I don't believe in this. I believe in this. My wife and I, we support about five or six missionaries every month. And we do this, and this is part of our life. Uh, you know, I'm going to Costa Rica on Wednesday. I'm so glad because of the monthly support that we have, and from this church as well. This church supports us monthly. Uh, but many individuals in this church support us monthly, and I'm thankful for that. Because here I am three days before I leave. I don't have to come up here and beg you guys and just say, please give an offering. Otherwise, you know, I can't bring my second suitcase or something. You know, you know, I, I, I'll, you know, I, I don't have to do that. Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're well taken care of through the monthly partnerships. And that's, uh, and that's a powerful thing. So if you don't give towards world missions, even a very small amount makes a big difference. And so we're very grateful, very thankful for anybody who does that. And it means a lot to us. Because anytime somebody sows into what you're doing, it means that they believe in you. And it's kind of humbling, actually. It touches your heart quite a bit. It will make such a difference when we go into the world. So if you're able to help out monthly, there's a form inside that newsletter. The best way is to use that form. And so you can give online. You can give from the, even from the City Center Church app. But the best way is through that form that's in the envelope in our newsletter. Let me leave you with one last visual. Did God say anything to you today? Did you enjoy this service? Let me show you just a picture of Canadian Fire Missions, some of the difference we made in around the world from Canadian Fire Missions, and we'll have a couple of prayer times before we go. Let's run that other video. It's less than four minutes.
how the world do you jam? You know, I think I'm coming up on my 42nd international trip here. Uh, more than a million kilometers. I've flown lots of hundreds of flights. Um, one of the last pictures there was a group of Filipinos surrounding me. You see certain nations more than others. It's because I've been to certain nations more than others. I've been to the Philippines seven times, Indonesia five times, Costa Rica, this is my fourth time, you know. And so some nations we've been to multiple times. But that one of those last pictures was a group of people surrounding me and praying for me, and I am losing it, crying my eyes out, because a typhoon hit that city. And every one of those people that surrounded me to pray for me all lost their homes. And they wanted to pray for me. Missions is a two-way street. It's powerful. It's awesome. You don't just go to give. You go and you receive. Because we don't have all the answers in North America. In fact, we need to be corrected and straightened out a lot of times. And we'll go with what we think is the way to do things because it's the Canadian way to do things. And then we get shown by others in other parts of the world that Jesus lives in them quite powerfully also, as you might expect. And so... I want to do something that I do in churches all over the world is I make a call for those who feel like they have an evangelism or missions call in their life. If that's you, I want you to stand to your feet. And again, you don't need to feel like you're called to be me and do it the way I do it because just like there are different pastors, there are different evangelists. This could be teenagers, this could be younger, older, but you have an evangelism or a missions call. Some of you, if you don't stand up, I'm going to go stand you up because there's <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at you guys, and so I know you have this call. And so if you have this call, I want you to, to stand to your feet. And Pierre, you've talked to me about this. I'm glad you're standing. And so Matthew, I know you've been with me several times. Can I get you guys to do something? Can I get you guys to come up here, and I want to pray for you, and I want the church to pray for you. And if you've been with me in other countries, you know how I do this. And so I'm going to ask you to come, and I'm going to ask you to stand along the front edge of this stage here. And I'm going to do, come right up here and face the people. And I'm going to go down there. And we're going to crisscross here. And church, I want you to see these people. Because these people are like the feet of the body of Christ. And depending on where they're at in their journey, I'm not saying you're coming with me on Wednesday. But this is something I do. You might have seen a couple of pictures where I'm doing that, where I'm down on my knees and I pray over someone's feet. And ever since God gave me this message, beautiful feet, it's like, it's like my signature in a way. And so I prayed over the feet of thousands of potential evangelists, missionaries. And crazy stuff happens. And so some of the prophetic words that have come and some of the different, you know, journeys that these people have taken since we prayed. I prayed over a lady in Venezuela. Five days later, she came to me and she said, I said, I can't even barely walk since you prayed for me. My feet have been on fire for five days. What did you do over me? I said, it's the call on your own life. It's not about me. But it's somebody recognizing that evangelistic call. I'm so thankful for these people because many of these people are the people who help make some of our outreaches happen here in the, in the city. Hey, we got to believe God for these people. That God's got a destiny and an assignment, and it might not look like mine. Uh, Jim and Shelly, you should be up here. What's wrong with you? Get up here, man. <laughs> I'm serious. You guys should be up here. And again, it's not that my prayer will change your call. I know you feel that you have an apostolic call, but you very much have that evangelistic call also. And that's super, uh, and it's important for the church to see. Because not everybody is the feet. If we were, you know, a body where everybody in the whole church responds and you're all the feet of the body, that doesn't work. You're like a centipede or something, a millipede, you know, a body with 10,000 feet and, you know, no head, you know, or whatever. And so not everybody can be the feet. Even my own wife, she's not that. She's, she's the hands. She's ministry of helps. And that's what many of you are. You're something different. Prophetic people are like the eyes. But these people, come stand close to the edge here with your toes hanging off the edge. And let's, let's stand to your feet, everybody, and let's pray over these ones. And let's pray over these ones. And the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And let's trust that God will say some things to different people. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Father God, for this man with sandals. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Father, we just pray over Alex Topisum. We thank you for his new assignment in his school. But I thank you for an even greater assignment that you burned on the inside of him, Father God. And that's that assignment to carry the good news. And so, Father, we pray over that in the name of Jesus, Father God. Help him sort out 
the issues and the struggles in his own life, Father God, and step into that amazing calling that you have for him in the name of Jesus. Father, we speak over this woman of God. Use her, Father God, to touch souls, to reach lives, Father God. Help her reorder her days, Father God, so she's able to serve you and step into that calling even here and now. Thank you, Father, for Lorna, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. She's got a missionary family, Father God. Her family, Father God, has touched nations and has been to nations and comes from different nations. And Father, so even just with grandchildren, she's got an international family. I pray, Father God, that she'll stand strong even in the midst of hard times, Father God. She'll stand strong, Father, with the fire that continues to burn in her heart. And while I pray for her, uh, I don't know where Murray and Pat are today, but I'm going to pray for Pat Frost as well because Pat and Lorna have been in Indonesia together. And I thank you that they share uh, the same type of calling, Father God. And they're not ins it's not insignificant. You know, we never need to compare ourselves to someone else's calling. If we do that, we'll just feel disappointed in ourselves because there's always going to be somebody who does something bigger or better somewhere else. But the best we can do is when we do what we have with what we have. So thank you, Father God. Thank you for Matthew, Father God. I thank you for this faithful brother who's been with me several times in several nations. I thank you, Father God, that he's laid down his life. We literally pretty much almost didn't lay down our life in Vietnam where we were kind of breaking the law. And I thank you, Father God, that you rescued us and pulled us out of that. And God, you're not done with Matthew. There's certain things that you placed and deposited on the inside of him that you're just beginning to shape and form and they're kind of coming to fruition. Thank you for these wonderful missionaries, Father God, to Romania and beyond. I thank you, Father God, for the prophetic words that you put inside the heart even many years ago. And I thank you, Father God, for them not sitting back in rocking chairs, <laughs> but running with the call that is on their heart. And so thank you, Father, for many marriages that will be put back together because of the fire and the passion to do world missions that they have. Come forward there, uh, Tina. Thank you, God, for Tina. God, I thank you for this tender heart that this woman of God has. And I thank you, Father God, that you help her go beyond. You help her go beyond what she's capable of seeing and doing in her own strength or energies, Father God. But she's able to carry out your gospel to broken people. Open doors for her, Father, that the rest of us may not be able to go through. And I thank you for that. Thank you for Ken and Elaine. Come, come, come. Thank you for these two, Father God. Your days aren't finished in the missions world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for the things that you have done. But life's not about you just telling stories about the stuff that you have done. There's some future missions endeavors that I believe God has for you. So I thank you, Father God, for those connections that you've continued to maintain in far off places. Thank you for the ways in which you speak into their lives. Thank you for the ways you've touched lives even right here in Saskatoon, being a part of City Center Church. God bless you guys. Thank you, Father, for Marlene. And I thank you, Father God, for a burning passion that lives and resides on the inside of her, a passion to share Christ. Thank you, Father, for the ways that her and Phyllis go and just go and they're not afraid to go to anyone. And so I thank you for the courage and the boldness that lives and resides on the inside of her. I thank you, Father God, for Pierre and the ways in which you are working in him. He came to me more than once just asking me, how's that work? How's that work? It's because, God, you've stirred something up inside his heart. And so I pray, Father God, pray, Father God, for him that he will find his way into the missions world in exactly the time and the place that you've called him to. Thank you for Scott and Angie, Father God. I thank you, Father God, for calling them anoint these feet to go, Father God, to go to places that they never dreamed imaginable. And so I thank you, Father God, that you're the one who makes a way. It's in your time and it's in your season and it's in your, it's in your purposes. So we thank you for that. Also for Jessica, Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint this woman of God to carry your calling, Father God. And for Jim and Shelley, thank you for all the places they've already been and all the lives that they've already touched. I thank you, Father God, that they are builders they are apostolic in nature. I thank you for that. But I thank you for the passion for souls that Jim carries, that Shelley carries. They carry a passion for souls. 
And so I thank you, Father God. I thank you that the plane's, you know, getting put back together if it isn't already. I thank you for the ways in which you use that, Father God, to reach them in their fields, Father God. Their fields might not be my fields, but their fields are awesome and people are important and you love, you love people and you love them through Jim and Shelley. And so use this man and woman of God, Father God. I'm so thankful you sent them to this place because you got something special from City Center Church. You're sending people from this place to the world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank God for the evangelists and the missionaries. Amen? Amen? Are you thankful? I'm thankful. Some churches, two or three people come forward. Some churches, like Faith Alive, 200 come forward. And then I have to sort it out a little bit. Because you know what? God's called every one of you to be a soul winner. He's called some of you to be evangelist, missionary, something like that. And so for these ones, keep these people in your prayers. Amen? Well, thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I don't see too many guests here, so I was going to do an invitation for salvation, but I don't know if I need to necessarily do that. If you need prayer, though, we always have some leaders that can hang out here at the front. I know I went a bit over time. And so uh, if you need prayer for anything, we're going to dismiss the service, and then uh, we're going to have some people come. We'll pray for Brad. Uh, yes. Why don't we get... The evangelist, why don't we just come around him here and Pastor Jim and come up? Why don't you guys just come to circle him? We're going to pray for him. Come on, everyone can come close. There we go. Well, Father God, we just thank you for the gift that Brad is and Kim are to City Center Church. That is, we saw in his heart today his passion for you, Jesus. And so we thank you that he takes that passion. They take the passion when Kim comes to everywhere around the world, Father God. And I just speak right now in the name of Jesus that that passion is going to get even kindled even more. Man, I see that fire being blown on right now, Brad. Whew, in a new way. Those embers that have been burning, man, there's going to be a new fire. There's going to be new uh, visible results when you go around in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father God, that this trip is going to be a transition point from something he's never seen before. I thank you that the power of God is going to follow him like it's never followed him. And when he speaks, it'll be sharp like a two-edged sword. It'll cut to the quick, Father God, and it'll be followed with signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. I speak the prophetic voice coming out, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, seeing into things to speak right to the very heart of matters with God following it with signs and wonders in the name of Jesus. I speak the grace over Kim as Brad travels, protection over him, everything that needs to go, goes, Father God, but most importantly, that those feet that he talks about, the evangelists, that they're just anointed to run and go and not go weary. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Brad, I've, I, I've had a word stirring in my heart over you, and, and I'll say some of it now, and some of it I'll probably say privately, but uh, I really felt like the Lord said that that and, and it, there was a word given to you by Dwayne that you're about ready to step into a shift into a season in 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 what God's called you to do that's that's going to be exponential beyond what you've even even imagined what you even could conceive in your own mind and I felt like the Lord wanted you to know that he's already prepared provision for that season in advance and that, that you're about ready to step under an open heaven that's going to so amaze you. And it won't come in the way that you even think it would come. And the Lord wants you to know that you, you shouldn't be afraid of a shift. You shouldn't be afraid. As a matter of fact, you're going to have to step into this thing. And every time we step into something, the Lord wants you to know you actually have to step from something. And uh, it doesn't mean that you step off the foundation. It just means that some things that were won't be and some things that haven't been will be. And the Lord wants you to, to he's preparing your heart. It's that transition of the heart that's gonna, gonna, gonna cause you to step into it. And I feel like the Lord wants you to know that, that the seeds that you will sow, even in the financial realm, out of this new season will be greater than the provision that you've ever seen. 
That's really the call of the word. In other words, the, as, as God gives you the grace to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support this and I'm going to support, that'll be bigger than everything that you've received to this point. And that's coming in this new season. Hallelujah. Just receive it by faith in Jesus' name.